Welcome to Truth for Health, the rest of the story the media is not telling you. This is Dr. Lee for America. And today we're going to be talking about what's going on with the World Health Organization, Marburg virus, monkeypox virus, and all of the media beginning to telegraph plans for another pandemic and more of that mass vaccination. Just last week, New York City opened mass vaccination centers for monkeypox. San Francisco declared a monkeypox public health emergency and Washington DC reported their public health concerns with monkeypox outbreak. What's going on? What's the risk to you, the average American? And what else is going on behind the scenes that the media is not telling you? Today, I'm going to be talking about all of this in more detail. And I'm going to also talk with you about some of the ways to help you improve your health and resilience, stay healthier, reduce your risk of infection, and understand how to prepare, not panic, and how not to give in to the fear mongering, because fear is the weapon they are using to control you and to gin up enough fear that you will agree to more lockdowns and more draconian measures, stripping your constitutional rights and your freedom as we have been experiencing since the World Health Organization declared the COVID pandemic in March of 2020. And we've seen what that has done to usurp and overturn all of our constitutional rights under this lawless administration that is more and more out of control, ignoring Supreme Court rulings, ignoring the science, demonizing those of us who speak the truth about the science and the actual risk, whether it's for COVID, the COVID shots, monkeypox, Marburg, or whatever other disease of the day that they are pushing on the public to control you through fear. First of all, keep in mind that monkeypox is primarily a disease of ground squirrels in Central Africa, and monkeys and humans can be infected, but it takes a lot more virus, and it's been known in Africa since 1958. In addition to that, it's also known that monkeypox is primarily spread mainly between men having sex with men, as I have explained in my earlier programs. Women can be infected with semen injected into the vagina by an infected man. But the biggest transmission, and this is acknowledged by the World Health Organization, if those of you are running into doctors and pundits, who tell you that it's not primarily a disease of men having sex with men. Here's the quote from Rosamond Lewis, the WHO's technical lead for monkeypox. She told a press conference this on Wednesday, this preceding week, which would have been July 20th. 98% of cases of monkeypox are among men having sex with men and primarily those who have multiple recent anonymous or new partners, end quote. Rosamond Lewis also went on to say that the monkeypox cases are typically men of young age and chiefly in urban areas. That would tie into the recent announcements in San Francisco, New York, and Washington, D.C., where there are high percentages of men who have sex with men. And these are urban areas with a lot of young men who fit the demographic profile that the World Health Organization lead 
technical expert on monkeypox, just announced in the press conference this week. So this is not racist. It's not stereotyping. This is what the data shows. And all of you need to know that. So if you don't fall into that category, you are at extraordinarily low risk of monkeypox. Now, that said, the WHO and the media are ginning up the fear about monkeypox. And they're showing all these horrific pictures of all these skin lesions, which make people feel disgusted and frightened when they see them. And they manipulate you through your emotional reaction to the pictures and the graphics and the headlines. Stop being manipulated by the emotional reactions to all of these images. If you don't fit the demographic of young men in urban areas having sex with men and lots of partners, then you are not at high risk of monkeypox. In addition to that, it's very important to understand that while monkeypox lesions on the skin look awful, and if people don't get any treatment and monkeypox spreads to other organs internally, yes, it can become a more serious illness. But in areas where we have good medical care and proper identification, early treatment, and proper hygiene, then you're not as much at risk of it becoming a serious illness as could happen with COVID. So we're going to talk more about the specifics of monkeypox in a moment. But first, I really want to set the stage about what's going on with the World Health Organization. They are, the press has suggested that there's no timetable for when their decision on declaring monkeypox a public health emergency of international concern may be made public. However, they are holding this as a threat over the population around the world, which really is a terrible thing to do to control people through fear when 98% of the cases are among promiscuous men having sex with men. So while they're at the time of this radio recording, there is no formal announcement from the World Health Organization. I want you to understand what the ramifications are when they do make that formal announcement. They are meeting right now, July 21 through 23, 2022, to decide whether to declare monkeypox and or Marburg hemorrhagic fever viral illnesses a public health emergency of international concern. That is the legal buzzword in WHO declarations that launches the International Health Regulatory Agreement signed in 2005 by over 190 countries to allow the World Health Organization to take worldwide control of, quote, the public health, end quote, response. This is the lockstep draconian global control legal framework that led to all the COVID lockdowns, mandates, and loss of medical freedom around the world, where governments around the world went lockstep with the WHO because they had signed this 2005 International Health Regulatory Agreement. And when WHO in March of 2020 declared COVID a public health emergency of international concern, that triggered those agreements to become operative, which suspended our constitutional rights, which we've seen with hospital patients and outpatients and our right to travel, our right to go to church, our right to work in a small business and keep it open, our right to shop, I, all of our rights were just suspended as of March, 2022, sorry, March, 2020, when Tedros announced the COVID emergency declaration. They are now with COVID emergency declaration set to expire 
the end of July 2022. Pay attention, everyone. This is setting the stage for the World Health Organization to declare another one, this time with either monkeypox, probably monkeypox, or possibly even Marburg hemorrhagic fever viral illness. And that's based on two cases in Ghana, Africa that were reported this past week. They could use either one of those. And that allows them to then implement the 2005 Health Regulatory Agreement, allowing the WHO to take world control of the public health responses of countries around the world. Now, what makes that even worse in 2022 than what we saw in 2020 is that the United States National Defense Authorization Act of 2022 is effectively moving the public health response across the United States under the control of the Department of Defense. I have posted a link on America Out Loud talk radio to the article that summarizes the 2022 National Defense Authorization Act. For those of you that want to read the source material, you have 901 pages or so of entertainment to just clarify what I've been talking about. But the ominous part about the fact that the 2022 NDAA moving public health response under the control of the DOD, the DOD itself, our military Department of Defense, already under Secretary Austin, already authorized the use of force to carry out the mandatory COVID shots. Now, that was stopped for a while with the lawsuits that were filed by a number of law firms, including Todd Callender's group, Disabled Rights Advocate, in August 2021, and the use of force was set aside, at least temporarily. The provisions are still there. Since there's already a monkeypox shot for mass vaccination that was authorized by the FDA, wait for it, in the fall of 2019, how interesting that that was done prior to the COVID epidemic pandemic. So given that we already have that monkeypox shot for mass vaccination, and New York City has already opened mass vaccination clinics, couple that with the fact that the FDA stated a few weeks ago that they're not going to require more clinical trials or component disclosure for these shots. So that means that alterations in the lipid nanoparticles can be made without the public knowing what's actually in the shots that you're getting. That raises the specter of further gene modification without our consent. We already know the COVID shots are gene therapy agents. They're not traditional vaccines. And so now the manufacturers are free to add those same components to whatever, quote, vaccines, end quote, they choose to do so. If they use the DOD mandate authorizing the use of force that is already in place, and if they declare monkeypox a public health emergency of international concern, then you can connect the dots and see that the likely next step in their playbook is going to be to make monkeypox shots compulsory. And enforcement can then be done by the U.S. military through loopholes that have been added to the NDAA in a recent House of Representatives resolution. That allows them to bypass the Posse Comitatus Act, which is the constitutional protection against U.S. military being used against U.S. citizens as a police force on U.S. soil. If our service members follow these orders to 
engage in military force for compulsory vaccination of monkeypox or anything else, then we have a dictatorship that America has never seen. And it appears that they can use the monkeypox shots as the replacement Trojan horse carrying the lipid nanoparticles and gene mod modification agents for that were in the COVID shot that people have started refusing. If they got the shot, many people are refusing the boosters and many people, about half of America are still not vaccinated with the COVID shots. If the military's in charge, then that makes a whole different and much more chilling and ominous scenario. What's also odd is that even the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are now to be part of any public health response. So that means access to financial institutions is also under this new coordinated totalitarian dictatorial control of public health with everything about our lives swept under the umbrella of public health under the control of the WHO and the public health response in the US under the control of the Department of Defense, which means the US military can be used in ways our founders never intended. These documents that I'm referring to will be included as links in the description of this show on our website. So please, if you would like to read more, you are welcome to do so. In addition, Truth for Health Foundation has fact sheets on hemorrhagic fevers that includes Marburg and Ebola viruses, among others. And we have fact sheet on monkeypox that will guide you to reputable information to help you make decisions to protect yourself and your family and to be active in your community to help stop the weapon of fear damaging people's psyche and causing physiological damage through the psychological weapon of fear. Right now, this information battle is for the hearts and minds and of the people. They are playing to your emotions. Do not give in to fear. Take control with information and preparation, not panic. If you turn to the information battle section in the article that I've posted as part of this show description, you may see the kinds of additional powers that the World Health Organization is seeking in the name of health and in the name of mitigation of risk. It's really quite chilling to look at the plans that they are making, the global elites are making for the rest of us that affect every aspect of how we live our lives. And what's also concerning is that the surge in monkeypox infections that they are using to create the weapon of fear have been reported since May outside of Africa where monkeypox has been a problem endemic since the 1950s when it was identified. And these outbreaks that are outside of Africa coincide with major international pride events. The biggest one recently was in the Canary Islands. And it was from contacts and contact tracing from that event with the infected men that cases were tracked to European countries. So for the average American, again, I emphasize your risk is low. And that is where we need to focus. What I'd also like for you to understand is that monkeypox, unlike COVID as a respiratory virus, 
does not spread easily from person to person. Monkeypox, when, when a patient, when a person is infected with monkeypox and they have the viruses in the bloodstream, it's called viremia, there is live virus in the saliva and other bodily secretions such as semen. That's what ultimately leads to the bloodstream circulation of virus, ultimately leads to getting to the skin where the skin lesions occur. There is also live virus that has been isolated from the scabs when the pustules scab over. So avoiding contact with infected people is the primary means of prevention and avoiding having sex with infected men is another way to prevent infection. So it's far easier to control the spread of monkeypox than even to control the spread of influenza or COVID-19 or the common cold because those are spread by coughing and sneezing with our respiratory droplets. So controlling the spread of monkeypox, you have to avoid direct contact with the bodily secretions of an infected person that include blood, semen, vaginal and mucus secretions, such as blowing your nose, feces, open lesions, and the scabs from the pustules, as well as the soiled linens or clothing from an infected person. So just be aware, you're going to read in the weeks ahead a lot of fear-mongering in the news. Turn off the news, except for here on America Out Loud and Truth For Health Foundation. Our website is bringing you truthful information with information on how to protect yourself and stay healthy. So I want you to understand that there are things you can do and avoid infection and avoid serious illness. With regard to the treatment of monkeypox, you're going to be hearing about a number of things in the media. First of all, if you're infected, you need to be at home in quarantine away from other people. And you certainly should not be having sex with other people when you're sick with monkeypox because it is transmitted in the semen. And some of these viruses can be identified in semen for weeks after an infection. For example, going back to a major consensus paper from the Working Group on Civilian Biodefense, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health published in 2002, Ebola and Marburg viruses were isolated from semen between 82 and 101 days after the disease onset and when the patients had recovered from the acute illness. So there is a long period of time that these viruses can be transmitted through semen. With monkeypox, the earlier vaccinia vaccine is no longer available and we simply, there is a new monkeypox vaccine that has been approved. And that was done in September, 2019. And it's a live non-replicating viral vaccine. But at the time that was approved, there were only two cases of monkeypox in the entire United States. Yet the government placed an order for $119 million worth of this new vaccine from the manufacturer, even though supposedly it wasn't going to be manufactured until 2023. And I have information in the links about that as well. There's also a current FDA approved antiviral treatment called TPOX, which has been nationally stockpiled by the United States since 2018 and was recently approved for IV use for monkeypox on May 19th, 2022. Isn't that interesting? Wonder what they knew in May of 2022. 
But this medicine, TPOX, has only undergone phase one clinical trials, it has not gone through the full phase two and three clinical trials or any post marketing surveys for safety testing and follow up. It was based on one human trial of only 359 healthy patients who were given the medicine before it was granted full FDA approval. There's been no testing in sick people. So understand that although you will be hearing a lot about this medicine, there is very little proper clinical trial data for you to make an informed dissent and informed consent to being given the new medication. In addition, we have very, very limited data on actual safety. In fact, there's been no long-term safety testing. So our position, what I would be recommending for my own patients, as well as our position as among the medical experts at Truth for Health Foundation, is that there are other antivirals in widespread use for many decades that have known safety profiles that are available for both prevention and treatment of monkeypox and other viral illnesses. And these older medicines have far more data on risk, benefits, and safety. So be advised, all of my America Out Loud listeners and those listening beyond our platform, be advised, don't buy in to all the media headlines and don't necessarily take the latest recommendations as your only option. Do your research. Make sure that you have your questions answered before you take another shot or take another experimental pill. We'll be right back after the break. This is Dr. Lee for America, and I'm on Truth For Health. The rest of the story, check out our website, www.truthforhealth.org. We'll be right back. All right, you've all heard Malcolm and the great Dr. Peter McCullough talk about the povidone iodine-based nasal spray, Cofix RX. They talk about it because it's a product that actually works in combating colds, flus, and coronaviruses. Cofix is made in the USA and recommended by thousands of doctors and pharmacists nationwide. It's simple. By attacking viruses where they incubate, you make it easier for your body to heal. Check out the Cofix RX banner ad on AmericaOutloud.com and save 20%. By using promo code OUTLOUD. Oral hygiene hasn't changed in 50 years, but our diet and the way we eat has. Creating an environment in your mouth for bacteria to wreak havoc on your teeth and gums. For better oral health, get Spry Dental Defense, an oral care line designed to combat acid-creating bacteria. The toothpaste, mouthwash, mints, and gum all contain xylitol a natural ingredient shown to dramatically improve oral health. Spry can be found online and at all fine natural retailers. Many Americans worry about their health four times a day. That's 120 times per month. To minimize the worries, leading nutritional supplement company, Healthy Cell, created Immune Super Boost, an immune supplement that contains full effective doses of science-backed nutrients like vitamin C, zinc, elderberry, and echinacea all in a one-a-day, pill-free, ultra-absorption ingestible gel. Supporting a strong and resilient immune system can be simple. Go to HealthyCell.com and use code AMERICA50 for 50% off any order of Immune Super Boost. That's HealthyCell.com, H-E-A-L-T-H-Y-C-E-L-L, and use code AMERICA50 for 50% off. Spreading the out loud truth from sea to shining sea. AmericaOutloud.com is the voice of liberty and justice for all. This is not a fight of Republican versus Democrat. It's not a fight of rich versus poor, old versus young, man versus woman, gay versus straight. It's not a fight of black lives, blue lives, Hispanic lives, or white lives. This is a battle of good versus evil. 
It's a fight for the soul of humanity. We are the vision of the voices, America Out Loud Talk Radio. Here on America Out Loud, we emphasize optimal health, and air is the most essential element for life. The average person inhales over 35 pounds of air every day. Yet we seldom think about how to rid the air of pathogens swiftly and safely when we need to. The Genesis Fogger Plus HOCL is the only way to quickly and naturally restore air to its optimal condition. Visit genesisfogger.com forward slash out loud for a free ebook on everything you need to know about HOCL and receive a 15% discount on the Genesis Fogger with promo code OUTLOUD. With Genesis, you'll be ready for what's next. This is Dr. Lee for America with Truth for Health. The rest of the story the media is not telling you. Check out our website at truthforhealth.org. We're talking today about the potential declaration from the World Health Organization about monkeypox or possibly Marburg hemorrhagic fever viral illness as the new pandemic that the global powers are going to be using to control us, push more experimental shots, IVs and pills like they did with COVID, with the COVID shot, remdesivir, and the new experimental antivirals that have so many side effects, drug interactions and adverse events and risk. So where are we? Right at the moment, that I am sending you this message in this program today. We don't have an official ruling from the World Health Organization about their decision, but they're telegraphing in the media, they're telegraphing through their hedging, and they're telegraphing from their meeting that they are gearing up for this next pandemic, likely to be in response to, quote, the monkeypox outbreak that is spreading around the world, that's an exaggeration. We simply don't have the volume of cases that normally would have warranted this, except they have other agendas. And for those of you in America, what do you suppose the biggest looming event on the horizon is that the global powers seeking one world control would like to disrupt. Think about it. What's coming up in November? Yes, that's right. The midterm elections. And isn't it interesting that Tedros, at in his opening remarks at the World Health Organization meeting just this week, made the comment, quote, I need your advice, speaking to the, those assembled, in assessing the intermediate and midterm public health implications, Tedros told the meeting on Thursday. Wow. He even telegraphed the connection with midterm. Hello, everybody. Midterm elections need to be disrupted if they want to maintain their lock on power, which they've done so effectively as a result of the stolen election of 2020. And that's been proven. That's no longer a theory. Six battleground states have documented fraud. Not one of them has acted on it. So we have the stolen election of 2020 and we have devastating consequences as a result with this lawless administration that is totally ignoring the constitution, the court rulings, the rule of law, medical rights, individual freedom, second amendment rights, every single right in the bill of rights has been thrown out the window by Biden incorporated this and his shadow government with Obama Inc behind the scenes. So that's what's going on. And that's why you're seeing 
all of a sudden, they're talking about a new viral disease. And they're talking about the ones that people haven't heard much about because people are tired of COVID. They figured out that COVID has a less than 0.03% death rate if you get it treated early and if you don't have all the serious medical illnesses and if you're not over age 75, COVID is treatable. People have finally awakened to that fundamental medical truth that most of us knew if we were, if doctors were honest, we knew in the spring of 2020 that COVID was treatable and lots of us were doing it. Our COVID treatment guide has been up there since 2020. And many frontline doctors, as early as February and March 2020, and I was one of them, were treating our COVID patients using the, the medicines we already had, medicines and nutraceuticals and home oxygen therapy, corticosteroids, nasal rinses, povidone iodine diluted, iodine diluted and used as a nasal rinse, hydroxy, I'm sorry, hydrogen peroxide diluted and used as a nasal and oral rinse. Chloride oxide has been used as nasal and oral rinses in dentistry for decades. And that also is antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal. So there've been lots of things that conscientious doctors using common sense and medical knowledge and applying common sense, basic medicine principles were using to treat their COVID patients. The same is true for monkeypox and you don't need to be in fear of it. What you do need to be in fear of is a government that's out of control that, that is absolutely determined to take total dictatorial control of this country and turn us into a totalitarian dictatorship under a Marxist ideology and continue their coup d'etat against the US Constitution. Consequently, that's what you need to be defending against and not complying with these unlawful orders. I want to also put in perspective some of the information. You're probably going to be hearing a lot more about Marburg hemorrhagic fever as well. Now, unlike monkeypox, which is not even as serious as smallpox, Marburg and Ebola are potentially very serious viral hemorrhagic fevers. Marburg has a known mortality rate of 50 to 90 percent. Sorry, that's Ebola. Ebola has a known mortality rate of 50 to 90 percent, and that's been well documented for a number for the last 20 years. Marburg mortality rate is in the range of 20 to 70 percent, depending on access to treatment. So these viral illnesses are very serious. And it's anyone who's reading any books that talk about the fact there are no pathogenic viruses, that's just simply not true. These pathogenic viruses, in fact, Marburg and Ebola have been known since biblical times. So they weren't identified, obviously, in those days because we didn't have the technology to do it. About the time of Christ, about 2,000 years ago, these viruses split off in mutations and became two different diseases. But Ebola virus and Marburg virus have been isolated in semen, as I said in the first half of the program, up to about three months after someone has recovered from the illness. So it's not correct to say there are no pathogenic viruses. It's not correct to say that these viruses can simply be treated with over-the-counter nutraceuticals. These are more serious illnesses and they need to be treated with great respect. However, there are options for treatment 
And there are options to keep yourself healthy and reduce your risk of infection. So what are the hemorrhagic fevers? Basically, these are highly infectious, severe viral illnesses caused by over 20 small particle pathogenic RNA viruses in four different viral families. Now remember, RNA viruses are more likely to mutate more rapidly than DNA viruses. That's part of the problem with COVID. These examples of hemorrhagic fevers include yellow fever, Lassa fever, Ebola, Marburg, and Rift Valley fever, yellow fever, and several fevers that are caused by New World arena viruses. They all can lead to potentially fatal diseases that are characterized by fever, severe lethargy, fatigue, literally people cannot get out of bed, vomiting, mucosal and gastrointestinal bleeding, edema, low blood pressure. In other words, there's circulatory collapse because you're losing so much liquid volume with diarrhea that, and so much blood volume with bleeding that literally the body can't maintain a normal blood pressure. There's not enough volume to do it. The problem that has limited our ability to have clinical and epidemiological data is the fact that the outbreaks in the past have been very sporadic. They've typically been limited mainly to Africa, sometimes Asia, occasionally South America. But for the most part, these diseases have been present primarily in Africa. The two that are most serious concern right now, and in general because of their high lethality, are Marburg and Ebola. And these are spread through person-to-person -person contact, including respiratory droplets from people who are actively sick. When someone is actively sick, the virus is then circulating in the blood that's called a viremia. And when they're coughing or sneezing, the virus can be expelled in the respiratory droplets. Infected, but it's not Ebola and Marburg. So far, the data has not shown that they are airborne in the usual sense of that. So it is contact with the secretions that is the primary mode of transmission. Infected people with symptoms, which is the viremia phase, can spread the virus to uninfected people when the infected person's secretions, saliva, respiratory droplets, blood, vomit, stool, vaginal secretions, and semen, come in contact with the mucous membranes, mouth, eyes, nose, rectum, vagina, or breaks in the skin of someone who's not infected. There is no documented evidence of spread during the asymptomatic prodromal phase. And that's discussed in one of the articles that I have as a link to this program. Family members can be infected as they take care of sick relatives because they're coming into contact with the bodily fluids of sick relatives and healthcare personnel can be infected if they're not using the proper barrier methods of protective equipment that covers them from head to toe. Some of you've seen pictures from the 2014 Ebola outbreak with the healthcare workers in the biohazard suits and they have the mask and, and the hoods and gloves and all of that. Hospitals also can use the decontamination strategies that we talk about in the health and resilience section on truthforhealth.org website. So I have posted a link to the earlier, this was the 2002 working group on civilian biodefense from the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health that did a major review of hemorrhagic fever viruses as biological weapons, the medical and public health management. If you're really interested in 
proper understanding of these viruses and putting risk in perspective, I encourage you to take the time to read that. Now, not all of the hemorrhagic fevers are transmitted by person-to-person -person transmission. The four that are include Ebola, Marburg, Lassa fever, and the New World arena viruses. Of the others in the hemorrhagic fever viral illness group, Rift Valley fever, yellow fever, and two tick-borne hemorrhagic fevers are not transmitted person to person. So all of this is summarized in the fact sheets on our website and in the article and ref medical references that I've put up for you. I want you to have reliable information. We're doing our best to bring that to you. Now, let's talk about another aspect of this. With regard to treatment for Marburg and Ebola, Triple monoclonal antibody therapy has been the most effective treatment available for Ebola in the past, and it is available in the U.S. National Stockpile of Medicines. That is under federal control. As we saw with the National Stockpile of Hydroxychloroquine during the COVID pandemic, the federal government refused to release the National Stockpile to disseminate, ultimately, we had close to 76 million doses of hydroxychloroquine that could have been made available to the public across America and helped early treatment and stop it much, early, much earlier in 2022. That was not done. There were many political roadblocks and even the president of the United States was not successful at breaking through the FDA roadblocks. AAPS, the Association of American Physicians and Surgeons, sued the F FDA to release the national stockpile and the suit was ignored and the FDA did nothing. So the fact that there is triple monoclonal antibody therapy in the national stockpile that could be used to treat Ebola does not guarantee that that's going to get to the American public in the event of a mass casualty event. So with that said, what options do we have? If we are in a war, we use the weapons we have at hand. We may not always have all the drugs we want. We may not have access to all the drugs we have. We saw that with COVID. So in the condition that we could have a, another outbreak and limited access to options that have more data, many of us on the front lines, and I'm working with several military special forces, combat trained physicians who have medical background, and I'm working with a, a, a lot of other frontline health professionals, and we are looking at what kinds of medicines already in our armamentarium do we have that might possibly be helpful if we're in another infectious disease war. That's what we did with COVID. We used the tools we had. We used the medicines we knew might work, and we used our best clinical judgment. That's what it comes down to when you're a doctor practicing in the trenches, trying to help save your patient's life. So from the Army, U.S. Army Field Manual for Medical Treatment, which is used by our special forces, and I sat down with a special forces Green Beret physician and went through his field manual of treatments that the military is using. And together, we found all of these. They're listed under the section of treatment of hemorrhagic fever. These additional medicines are ones that we don't have a lot of clinical trial data, of course, because there's, there's not been very many outbreaks of these viruses. But albendazole, mebendazole, and fenbendazole are ones that have been used. They are FDA-approved dewormers, similar to ivermectin, 
and they've been used for deworming humans and veterinary use, as well as treating parasites. But similar to ivermectin, they all have anti-inflammatory and antiviral properties as well. And they are included as options in emergencies in combat by our US military. So I don't think I'm being overly speculative in bringing this information to the public since it's already been part of military training for a number of years. There's also an oral and IV agent, ribavirin, that has some in vitro and in vivo activity against two of the four hemorrhagic fever families, but not against Ebola and Marburg. So the fact that oral ribavirin has been licensed for treatment of chronic hepatitis C, and because it's oral and because it's more available, in 2002, our own Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and the Working Group on Civilian Biodefense recommended that in a mass casualty event and an outbreak of hemorrhagic fever when IV resources would be limited due to the large numbers of patients that might need help, this oral medicine could be used. So that's our own expert panel from Johns Hopkins in 2002 that was suggesting that option. Again, we don't know what the data actually would show at this time. We now have a large population of Americans who've been vaccinated with the COVID shot and who have immune deficiency syndrome. Are they going to be more susceptible to these viruses? Yes, that's a possibility. And are they going to respond the same way to treatments that may have worked in the past in other countries with different types of populations? We simply don't have answers to those questions. There is information coming from countries such as those in Africa, where practitioners in other countries, Africa, South America, and some in Asia, have reported some effectiveness using hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin for the viral hemorrhagic fevers as well. Do we have data, clinical trial data? No. Can we say definitively that these are effective? No. If you're in an emergency and that's all you've got, I love what our wonderful colleague, Vlad Dr. Vladimir Zelenko said, before he tragically died so young of cancer. And he said, if you're in a war and you wish you had a 50 caliber weapon, but you, all you've got is a musket, you use the musket. Well, hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin may be a musket, but if that's all we've got and it's an emergency and your life is on the line, that's something you can prepare for and have available. And that's my philosophy of life do my best to be prepared for the worst, pray for the best, and hope that the worst doesn't happen. But preparation, not panic, is the code word for survival and resilience and recovery and all of the things that we need to do to save our constitutional republic. I urge all of you, please, Take the time now before there's an emergency, before there is more fear mongering, download the fact sheets at truthforhealth.org. Consider donating to support our work. Our medical doctors and scientists are all working pro bono, myself included, to do this as a public service. Please donate to support our work, help us reach more people download our fact sheets, share them with your network, get the kinds of supplies on hand that we are talking about. Listen to our Faith Over Fear seminar series. Learn the practical steps you can take now to prepare. Don't just play ostrich with your butt up in the air and your head in the sand. This is a time to take steps to prepare, not panic. And 
I want to leave you in closing today with two important scripture references. I think whenever we are afraid, whenever we are worried, overwhelmed, turn to the Bible, turn to the Lord for support and comfort. This first scripture is from Luke chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. For there is nothing hidden that will not be exposed and nothing concealed that will not be made known and brought to light. Pay attention, therefore, to how you listen. And that was Jesus talking to his disciples, encouraging words for you today. And from the Old Testament, Proverbs 29, verse 25, the fear of man is a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. God bless you all. God bless America. And may all of you on America Out Loud and Beyond get loud, get involved, and let's preserve our God-given gift of life, liberty, and our constitutional republic. This is Dr. Lee for America, signing off for today. We'll be back next week.